It's time for another episode of The Weekend DevOps with your host, Will Button from DevOps for Developers. Take it away, Will. Um, yeah, so as the voices were saying, um, this week I was working on a message consumer app that's... Um, it takes a message off of a queue, off of a RabbitMQ queue, and it dynamically provisions a Kubernetes environment that runs a Jupyter notebook and then maps these uh, data sets through so that data scientists can do data analysis on it. Say, you think you can throw any more buzzwords in there? You know, really pump up the old YouTube algorithm with SEO? Uh, sure, yeah. So we're using Kubernetes, like I mentioned, which runs obviously Docker containers and the message consumer is written in Python. But check this out. This is the message payload that we get from the uh, RabbitMQ message queue. And it's got this command here, which is either create or delete as to whether it should be creating a new environment or deleting an existing environment. An environment session ID, which is a unique identifier for this environment. And then the resources to provision in terms of CPU, memory, and GPU. The image tells it which of the uh, Kubernetes environments it should launch, and then an array of volumes that the data scientist would like mapped into this environment. So the first thing that we need to do whenever we receive this message is create a connection to Kubernetes so that we can actually talk to it. And now if you run the kube control command locally, you have a kube config file that contains all of the parameters and security credentials needed to talk to Kubernetes. Now this application doesn't have that, so I had to build one dynamically, and it may actually talk to multiple Kubernetes clusters. So it's gonna need different credentials for each of those clusters. And so I ended up using this Python method called load cube config from dict. So inside of the application, there are some different environment variables that provide the credentials to different Kubernetes clusters. And I take those environment variables and use that to create the Kubernetes config that allows it to talk to a particular cluster. Now, the part that was challenging on this is that method is not documented anywhere. I went through all the Kubernetes documentation I could find and couldn't find any reference to how to implement it. And what I ended up doing was going through the Python library itself and then going through the tests for that library, I found the unit test where they were actually testing this method and was able to determine what the dictionary signature should look like from there. And that I really point that out just because that highlights why I keep saying over and over again that you don't have to know a programming language to start doing DevOps, but you're going to want to learn one eventually because in this case, the ability to read the code was the only way I was able to figure out how to implement this exact method. Now that we have a connection to Kubernetes, I take all the parameters that were in that message payload and I provide it to this Jenja template. So a Jenja template, if you're not familiar with that in Python, is um, a way to substitute variables into a dynamic document and generate an end result. And you'll see an example of that here in just a couple seconds. But we provide that in, render out the YAML template, and then iterate. There's actually multiple resources configured in this process. So for each of the resources that are generated from our Jinja template, we use this method create from dict and actually apply that, which is the same thing as running your Qcontrol apply dash F to apply the contents of a file to Kubernetes. So once that's all deployed, we ended up with a route inside of our Kubernetes environment that was accessible through the Nginx ingress controller. And I fired up the Jupyter notebook and wah, wah, get a 404. The reason is because the Jupyter notebook was looking for Jupyter notebook to be running on the root URL. So not within a subdirectory on the web server because Jupyter notebooks typically are launched and executed by someone on their laptop or on their desktop, and they just run it locally. So it's kind of expecting to be running on localhost with no other services running around. The problem in, in this instance with that though, is some of these data sets that are gonna be analyzed here 
are hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes. And I don't know what kind of laptop you've got, but none of the ones I have are gonna be able to do any kind of data analysis on that much data. So that's the reason we moved it over to Kubernetes. We just gotta tell the Jupyter Notebook that it's gonna be running behind a load balancer and not on localhost. And so in digging through the documentation for Jupyter Notebooks, I found this base URL parameter that allows me to tell the Jupyter Notebook that it's running within a subdirectory and not on the root of the web host that it's running on. So now I just need to get that fed over into the Kubernetes configuration that we launch. So now I'm gonna do that over in this Jenja template. And in the Jenja template, we've got the container section of our Kubernetes manifest. And in there, we've got the arguments, we've got the command that we're launching in the Docker container. And then we provide a list of arguments to that command. And one of the arguments that I added is this notebook app dot base URL, as we saw in the documentation. And then I provide the value of the URL that this thing is gonna be hit at whenever we deploy it to Kubernetes. Now take a look at this. You can see this right here, the double curly braces with environment session ID inside of it. And that's kind of the way that Jenja templates work, right? You can um, render your Jenja template and anything that it sees in between the double curly braces, it's gonna look for a variable with that same name and then substitute the curly braces and whatever is inside of there with the results of that variable. So in this instance, if our environment session ID were equal to the number three, it would create the base URL whenever it renders this templates as slash environments slash three. And now whenever we deploy all that, go out to the Kubernetes environment, hit that URL, boom, just like that, our Jupyter Notebook comes up with the data mounted to it and it's accessible through a URL so that anyone on this team can hit it, do their data science-y stuff, and gain access to all of the resources and hardware that's powering this Kubernetes cluster without having to tie up their own laptop. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. That was, um, you know, we looked there at how to dynamically create Kubernetes environments as part of a microservices architecture using decoupled systems that are talking to each other through a message queuing service called RabbitMQ. And then we did um, some code stuff and some DevOpsy stuff too to create a unique solution for this client. And um, I hope that was uh, helpful for you. How about, How about some more of those, those buzzwords, buzzwords Will? Will? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I already mentioned Kubernetes and uh, Docker. I guess I can point out that we're not running on AWS, that uh, we're actually running on bare metal, which I can only assume is, I guess, like the heavy metal version of the bare naked ladies. But it's been one week since we left the cloud and it'll still be two days before I say I'm sorry because we've got our code in a Git repo. So if you want to get the code, you got to get the code out of the Git repo hosted in GitLab. So, you know, we got that going for us. And then we mentioned the Nginx is doing our ingress controller and the whole thing's written in Python. So we can throw that buzzword back in there. And now we do this rolling update thing. So by doing rolling updates, we protect our uptime and that helps us preserve our SLAs because if you blow the SLA, that can lead to an incident. And once you have an incident, then you got to track the MTTR, which is mean time to resolution. And that's just a pain in the butt. Um, and then we also have pods in Kubernetes, which I think they're just kind of like the pods that they put us in at night here when the guards come through. I don't, I don't really know. We're not allowed to ask about that. Um, but we use a lot of open source code. And the thing about open source code is it's a lot like the paid versions of code, except it doesn't have the features. So you can build the features into the open source code yourself, which ends up costing you more time and money than what the paid version would have to begin with. But that makes it cool, right? So we do a lot of that. You just got to account for that whenever you're giving someone your lead time. And when it comes to lead time, I mean, it's really just a fictional number. You can literally throw out any single number that you want and 
everyone knows that you're just making up a random number, so no one really actually holds you accountable to it. We've just all collectively agreed, I guess, to not call bullshit on your lead time number. Um, but then we also run our SaaS on a pass, which runs on our IaaS, which is IaaS infrastructure as a service, not my ass, which is probably going to be what's on the line after people see this video. And then we can do a dark launch. Now, the cool thing about dark launches is mean it means that you can just deploy to production without telling anyone, right? Because, you know, while they won't admit it, the thing that customers actually like most is whenever shit that used to work doesn't work anymore. But then since you did a dark launch, you can actually do a dark fix after that and just go fix whatever you broke without telling anyone about that either. You know, now that I think about it, I think if I go back and re-record this and actually set it to music, I might have written the world's most SEO friendly song. Yeah, so I'm going to go do that and uh, I'll see y'all in the next video. Thank you